Welcome to Concerning the Spiritual in Art, a podcast exploring spirituality, consciousness, and the creative process. I'm your host, Martin Benson. All right, y'all, welcome to the very first episode of Concerning the Spiritual in Art. Um, To kick this whole project off, I have my uh, dear friend and fellow visual artist, Skylar Smith, um, with me to start with the first episode. Um, Skylar is a visual artist based in Louisville, Kentucky, and her and I met for the first time when we actually showed together in a group show. We just really hit it off. Um, We have a lot of similar ideas and thoughts that go into the work that we do, and we could just talk forever. And so I thought it was really fitting um, to highlight her and her work for the very first episode of this um, podcast. Um, We talked so much about not only her uh, history as an artist and sort of the work that she had done, some projects she was doing before the pandemic, but how the pandemic really catalyzed her back into a studio practice um, that led her to the work that she's doing now. Um, We talk a lot about spirituality, sacred geometry, meditation. Um, The podcast really goes to a lot of places and it's super inspiring um, for me to speak with her. And I hope you all really enjoy uh, learning not only about her and the work she does, um, but some of these bigger ideas that go into it. Um, So without further ado, here's Skylar Smith. All right, we're going to kick it off. Skylar Smith, welcome to the podcast. First episode. We're launching this thing right now. We're just letting it take off. Um, So happy you could be here with me. How are you doing today? I'm great. I'm doing great. good. Thanks for having me. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And just for some context for, for people out there, Skylar and I did a group show with a couple other artists back in Louisville, Kentucky at uh, Quapi Projects. It was uh, in April and May, and we just really hit it off. Um, and I just, I've always just loved your work, seeing it from afar on Instagram. And then we got to do a show together and connect in person. And now here we are getting to dive a little deeper into your work. Um, And I'm really fascinated by the way that you work. I love how you kind of bridge opposites together, like thinking about like duality, but like merging these things in a lot of ways. And in your artist statement, you talk about kind of merging micro and macro perceptions of consciousness within your work. Could you unpack that for me and like talk (laughs) a little bit about that? Because I kind of, I get what you mean, especially knowing your work, but I think it's a really fascinating thing to kind of peel the layers back on. Definitely, definitely. So like the micro macro idea I've been working with for like probably decades, really. I mean, um, and that just kind of started really with a um, just a love of nature and um, kind of nature on a very, very small scale, like things we can't see with our eyes, microscopic life um, and just the beauty of that. I used to... um, uh, take microscopic images of like plant cells, uh, bacteria, and project them onto campuses and kind of um, start my paintings kind of based on that kind of imagery. Um, and the more I worked with that imagery, you know, it was just really, you could I could see so many other things within that microscopic view. Um, like microscopic views look like aerial views, right? Like when you're mm-hmm. flying- high above, you know, uh, but you can see, you know, you're in a plane, you can see um, earth, but it's like it, it, what you see looks like what we might see under a microscope in some ways. It's just like these different growth patterns that manifest yeah. at a very small scale. Um, and then beyond that, like um, thinking about also things, you know, we need um um, telescopes to see or other types of lenses to see things, you know, beyond our planet. Mm-hmm. Um, so just that kind of interest in um, the natural world, whether it's like here on earth or, or beyond. Um, but, but that there's so much we can't see with our eyes, you know, um, but then that relates to also this kind of more like a metaphor for like a spiritual kind of um way of thinking about things like yeah. you know we can't see um um love or what you know these, these yeah that we have or these connections that we have but we know that they're real and that they're there so um and you know 
the this micro macro idea of course is like an ancient idea and a lot yeah. of philosophers have you know looked into this and alchemists and so there's a tradition with with that um but this was just something that i kind of came to on my own like you know probably when i was in my early 20s um and just just this kind of like wonder like mm -hmm. at um these natural forms on both, you know, scales that we can't, we can't see. Um, so that's where that comes from. And then I would say my work um, has followed that, that interest for a long time. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it kind of took a turn <laughs> um, <laughs> after. Like after, it always does. Like it always does. Yeah. I mean, I've been interested in political art and feminist art um, for a long time as well, but um, I've I've been an abstract artist yeah. for, for most of my art making experience. Um, and then in uh, when was it? 2016, 2017, you know, when Trump was elected, I just, I don't know, something in me, I was like, I have to make figurative art and I have to make art that's like, that people can look at it and know right away what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make art that was just, um, I mean, I think my art is accessible, but I wanted it to, to just like right away kind of reach someone by using the human form. Yeah. Um, and I had a show um, that was just kind of um, looking at, that election um and just what it meant for a lot of people um you know not just women but but a lot of people uh, marginalized communities and um and i wanted to make i had a show with a friend who i collaborate with um i've had several shows with her her name's lisa simon and um and we got together like we gotta make a show we gotta you know we gotta like really like speak to this moment so yeah. so that's where i in my artist statement, I talk about the micro and the macro. And then I talk about the, I think I say something like the human, the human scale perception, or I don't know. I don't know yeah. exactly, but it, but I was trying to bring this whole political element um, into my work, which um, is, is so inspired by nature and like my own, like spiritual, you know, relationship with, um, the universe, you know, however you want to put it. Um, <laughs> right, whatever you want to call it, right? However you want to say it. Yeah. But, but which, which you know, is connected to you studying yoga for a long time and teaching yoga. Um, and we can talk more about that. But um, but then I just had this like very like human scale, like political, you know, um, piece that I wanted to bring into my art. And it, mm -hmm. it, and it seemed like it didn't, initially kind of like sync up with what I'd been doing. Um, but it, it was like, I don't care. This is important to me. I've got to, yeah. you know, go with like, I've got to follow my heart. And, and then from that show, it led me to um, curate a show called ballot box, um, which was like such an amazing experience. It was the, I've curated shows in the past, but I've always like put myself in the show. And yeah, for this show, I was like, you know, it, I already said what I needed to say with, with that show I was just talking about, um, which was called The Personal is Still Political. Mm -hmm. I want to like create a platform for other artists to talk about um, their feelings. It was specifically about voting. Yeah. Um, so that was great. And I, I, you know, that's just another part of my practice is to, um, to curate you know, to kind of, it's very creative. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like what you're doing with podcasts. You're curating. Right. Podcasts. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. With Bringing artists. people together who have like a similar vision or are like coming from maybe a similar place, even if it's like a small thread of connection, like when you start to see those connections between other people who are working in similar mediums or materials or in certain genres, like it's always good to try to bring them together, especially if you're the kind of person who has the ability to do that. Cause I think community and collaboration, even if it's like we're doing our own thing, but we're collaborating by sharing space with each other or sharing dialogue like this, like that is so crucial for growing the collective consciousness. 
Yeah, and yeah. I think about like your work, you know, in relation, you mentioned like alchemy, you know, with the micro macro, you know, as above, so below, you yes. know, it's yeah. like what we see in the big picture, we see in the small picture, you know, and I think that definitely relates to what you're talking about with, you know, taking these tangents and stepping outside of your comfort zone during that really heightened political environment to feel like you needed to make some work that was resonant with the times. And so you were able to still explore the micro macro, but in a different sort of genre, a different way. And I think that's always great for artists when they feel that impetus to step outside of the comfort zone that they're used to. It's always a good thing, regardless of what the outcome is. So I think that's amazing that you felt that energy and you went with it. And what I think is cool is like, you you went through and did those shows and then you come back and to revisit the work you were doing before that. Can you talk about maybe that experience of like coming back into abstraction and like what that was like for you? Yes, definitely. Um, so Ballot Box, the show I was just talking about that just had to do with uh, voting rights. And it was like, it was the centennial of the 19th Amendment in 2020. Um, and it was the presidential election. And it was like, an, the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act from 1965. And I mean, there's a lot of like, just this like, why is voting important? And how many people throughout history have been like kept from voting? And that continues to happen, right? That was like the theme of the show. And um, so I worked, you know, I got a grant to do it and it was just, it was awesome. You know, we got some great artists. Um, and then the opening for the show, was I will not forget it's my husband's birthday. It was March 12th, 2020. Oh Jesus. <laughs> and oh Lord. Day, like the day before, I mean it was crazy because I we had a press me uh, we had like a meeting with the mayor because it was good. The show was uh set up in uh, Metro Hall, which is like where the mayor has his office in downtown. Mm -hmm. So I had it in like a you know, um, a state building. I mean, that yeah, was like a public space, thing. public space. Yeah. It wasn't mm -hmm. like a traditional art space. And we had like all press conference about the show, like on Wednesday. And then like the next day it was like, I kept hearing like this, all the stuff about like COVID or whatever, the coronavirus, whatever we were even calling it back then. Um, and I just remember talking to like the public art director, just being like, do we need to cancel this show? Like, mm -hmm. know, I was like, this is like, this is serious. And she's like, yeah, stay tuned, you know, but it was just like, it happened so quickly. And like the city of Louisville shut down just like within like the next day. So we had to, we postponed the show. You're we like, oh yeah, we'll have this show in like a couple of weeks. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, when's this whole thing like just kind of I know I hate to laugh like now about it because it's just like what a crazy traumatizing situation for everybody but like there's got to be a sense of humor of like wow the absurdity of thinking that in that moment that you could start like, oh three weeks you know and that's oh, what Lord. they said about schools too I know yeah like schools were still in session and like mm -hmm. so the show was going to be on that Friday night and I think they were like on Friday they were like oh you know, public schools are going to be temporarily closed for three weeks until we get a handle on this, you know, two years later. Right. But anyways, okay. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But, but then, but that forced you to go back into the dream cave, right? Like back into, yeah. back into hibernation mode in terms of like in your exactly. studio, like, and go exactly. within again, which totally. is crazy. Totally. Yeah, I had been running all over the city, you know, when you're curating a show, like you're just, you know, you're just like out and about and mm -hmm. pulling things together. And I was trying to, I had a lot of community partners um, because I agree, like for me, I, I need my like alone time to work and to be like introspective, but a part of me really likes to collaborate and needs community. I need like that. I need that it's like the dualism, you know, <laughs> like, like I, I need both. Yeah. Um, so I relate to that a lot. You know, I feel like I'm an ambivert, you know, I have extroversion and introversion and I, and yes. that's why I'm a painter, you know, like I have to go inside and need that silent time so yeah. I can relate to that for sure. Kind of regroup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And get grounded. And anyway, I mean, and so we, we all were kind of forced into that, 
um, place of you know, we, everyone went into lockdown and I mean, some people were, could still work and, you know, and, and I had been like a full-time teacher um, before I curated this show and kind of got into that whole thing. Um, I helped kind of start this art school and, you know, it, basically it was like a, a new business and education and all of this and was doing that for like over 10 years. Wow. Um, yeah. And that was, you know, just a wild ride on its own. But anyways, I left that organization um, in 2019. So it, it was kind of, I was like newly, like not teaching full time and I was curating the show and I had a couple other things going, but I, it, it was kind of an interesting point in my life just to begin with. Um, COVID comes, everything shuts down. I'm home 24 seven with my two kids, um, one of who could, couldn't read yet. So she was trying to do online school, but like she couldn't read. So that oh, was man. Like, she needed like help. Yeah. You know? Um, so it was, you know, for me, um, it was really challenging just because I, I was just so full-time with them kind of trying to uh, make sure they were like doing their online school. And we were just like, together all the time. And my, <laughs> my husband who works in construction, um, he kept working through yeah. COVID. And I mean, really lucky that he could keep working. Um, but he would be gone all day. Wow. Um, so it was, it was tough. I, I just, um, really like, so to have my time, my introspective time, you know, like I had to really carve it out and I had a studio in our basement, in our house, um, and I was just like, I just gotta go down there and like work for like whenever I can for yeah. maybe, maybe it's just an hour, maybe it's 30 minutes. Maybe I could work for, you know, I could break that up into like chunks of time. So I just started, um, making these like small paintings on paper because I had all this like, um, handmade paper that I worked with this, um, this paper making company in um, Indiana, we we made this paper, um, and I so I had the paper, I had like to, you know I had my paint and whatever, and I was just like I just gotta like just just make some art or I'm gonna yeah, um, yeah. So I, you know, it that's where I, but the silver lining in all of it was that I really uh, because that show I was curating was just kind of on pause. Um, I mean, I really like had to just sit still and make art, you know, mm. which I just hadn't been doing because I, you know, I was kind of a, a lot of like, just even before that, when I was teaching full time, it was sort of like art would be like the last thing I would let myself do. You know, I, you know, I was like, well, I got to work. I've got kids, you know, um, I wasn't prioritizing it mm. as much. Um, and I would line up a, a show. So I, it's like, I would have a deadline to make art. Cause I would have a show <laughs> and I feel like I got to make <laughs> something because otherwise there's nothing going to be, you know, in this, yeah. show. So that would, I would always have that going, but I felt like, oh gosh, I'm just making art for this show. And, and because I'm a, you know, I used to teach uh, college and, you know, I, I had to like show my art because that was a part of my like scholarship to be, you know, to be a teacher and whatever. So it just felt like I wasn't, I wasn't putting it like as a priority in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when, when we, in the lockdown, I, I just realized, I was like, geez, you know, this making art is keeping me sane and it's keeping me just like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Giving me some grounding, um, and the imagery that I, I was just like, I just need to make, I was thinking a lot about mandalas and I was thinking about, um, you know, other visual art forms that were used in meditation and as a way to kind of, um, you know, to, to create a focal point for the mind. Mm -hmm. So definitely working a lot with geometry and with color, um, and looking at other artists, um, like Hilma Offklint, which mm -hmm. 
lot of people like, oh, your works. I mean, I've heard that a lot. And I used to, anyways, I used to be like, yeah, I like her, but my art's, you know, it's my own. But now I, <laughs> I, I'll take, I'll take it. She's yeah, an right. amazing artist. And beyond that, like artists like her who had this like intense spiritual, you know, connection, not only personally, but they brought it into their art. Um, I, you know, was like looking at Hilma off Clint and, you know, and I discovered more, um, artists that, you know, Kandinsky, of course, you know, there's like, there's artists that I kind of knew, but I just discovered all these artists I didn't know about Yeah, uh, because yeah, you know, I was kind of just in this headspace. Like I want to learn more about artists that are, that were, you know, contemporary artists, but also artists from, you know, modern art. Yeah. Um, and from our past, you know, um, past. see and seeing some of those threads that come through. I mean, when we think of someone like uh, Hilma F. Clint, you know, like everyone knows about her now, which is amazing because of that yeah. big Guggenheim show. And I, and I hear that a lot as well. And I think what's so amazing, I'm, I'm, I'm super glad that she is like at the forefront of people's awareness now, because I think the work she was doing was revolutionary for that time. But what she was tapping into was very ancient and archaic and sort of ancestral and deep, you know, like it was, she was tapping into an energy that cultures have been tapping into across the globe, just not in Western art in the way that we've seen it, you know, except for maybe like the alchemists, you see them talking a lot about sacred geometry and these sacred forms or symbols and metaphors that relate to like consciousness and awakening consciousness. But right. she was doing it in such a playful way with the abstraction. But, you know, people who are aware of these histories can look at her work and see exactly what she's referencing. And right. I think, you know, right. nowadays we we have the luxury of having access to the all this sort of incredible library of artists, some who are previously unknown and now they're known because of the Internet. And so that definitely has influence. But I think what you're doing is still tapping into something primordial about geometry and form. And I love the way that you play with sort of the rigid ge ge geometry in the structure of your work. But you also have a lot of fluid, organic qualities in them, the way that you dye the paper and drip ink and sort of the way you let gravity and the materials kind of do their thing. So it's kind of like this dichotomy of control and lack of control and trying to find a balance between the two, which I think ultimately circles back to this relationship of duality of micro macro inward outward you know all of these sort of components and i think you honing in on this notion of making a meditative piece something that focuses the mind is is a powerful structure to like begin even those processes that you are playing with and when i see your work and i'll be showing lots of the work it will flat maybe flash an image right here maybe put one right what right there boom we can put one up yeah, I like the. I think about the ones that you did for the show we were in with uh, playing with the elements, right? The air, earth, water. I don't know if fire was in that one because, you know, John uh, Brooks, who was our curator, another amazing artist who curated that space. And then you had ether. But like within those pieces, there's such incredible energetic components, the way you play with color and pattern and form. Can you maybe speak to like, this idea of the elements and what drove maybe those particular pieces. Cause I, I wish I had more time to spend with them, you know, um, not being able to see them longer than the night that I was at the show. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, another like part of my work and, and what definitely came through, um, in 2020 and 2021, when I was working, it's just like the healing part of, art making mm -hmm. and you know for me like as a kid I've I, I've just been making art ever since I was little and looking back on it now I mean I, I probably would have been diagnosed with like ADHD but like I grew up in like the late 70s and 80s and they you know like it, it's not as you know diagnosed as it is now mm -hmm. but one thing that um, calmed me down was drawing and so my mom was like constantly just like putting a pencil in my hand, like all the time, all the time, all the time. Wow. So I like, I got better at it. Yeah. <laughs> just, Naturally. Thought, it was like just one thing that would like focus me. Yeah. And when I was working um, 
in the, in lockdown, I really felt this, how therapeutic it was to make art. Like I was, because it, it does focus me. Hmm. And I was just like, wow, that's really what, what it was doing when I was a kid. Like it yeah. just created this like zone where you, you know, you look, lose awareness of yourself and yeah. the, that flow and the, this yeah. in the way you can, when you practice yoga. Or exactly. You- I think in your artist statement, you, I love this phrase that you said, I wrote it down. It's, um, nanoseconds of nirvana yes. you know yes. and that's such a great way to describe it it's like these little glimpses when you lose like this sense of like being the doer and just letting the doing the the act happen through you you know what i mean where like the identification with what's happening subsides and there's just what's happening And it's such a beautiful thing. And you being, I know, a meditator and a yoga practitioner, you're cultivating that quality, you know, through those practices. But it's so obvious when you feel the energy of your work that that, those nanoseconds of nirvana are happening while you're working. And I think that in my weird mind, I feel like on some quantum level that imprints that energy in the work and that people, when they see it on some level of their consciousness can feel that calmness, that clarity, that focusing of the mind, like what you're talking about. Would you agree with that? Like, well, I mean, that's great. I, I, I hope, I mean, yeah, like I, I hope people get that. Like, cause I, I have this healing. I mean, I'm getting back to it now where it's like, I'm making art, like I'm making art, whether I have a show lined up or I don't like, it's yeah. just like, I feel like I have a different relationship with my work. Um, now that I'm not teaching full time, um, and my kids are a little bigger, <laughs> I just have like more space for yeah. it. So, um, like I f- have this, you know, it's healing for me to make art. So I hope if other people get that, then that's great. Yeah. But just like, I think that's what got me into yoga. Um, I, I won't, I'll never forget the first yoga class I took. I was in college, um, by visiting and my mom was into yoga and she was like, Oh, you got to come to this yoga class with me. Um, so we went and it was just like a Hatha yoga. Like it was not a, a strenuous class. I mm-hmm. um, you know, so it was just like very like, yeah. um, and I just remember at the end when we were lying in Shavasana, I was like, this is the most calm I've ever felt in my life. Wow. Like my body was just like, thank you. You know, yeah. I was like, what, this is like magic. What is like, all we did was stretch, like, <laughs> oh, I, like so relaxed, you know? Yeah. So that just put me on like the whole journey of, of just yeah. a practitioner and then doing the teacher training. And I don't teach anymore, but I still practice and, yeah. um, you know, so for me and, you know, just being able to study, you know, yoga philosophy, of course, asana is just one limb. Yeah. Okay. But, um, and, uh, you know, learning about chakras and it, it's that same idea of the micro macro that like yes. we have fire and air and water and ether within us. Mm-hmm. And in fact, like there's an idea that, that they, that these chakras are in different places of our body and they kind of have these, um, uh, properties you know yeah. so of course digestion that is the fire you know right. like you're digesting this food and so i you know i'm i definitely follow ayurveda you know mm-hmm. um, when i i can easily just kind of get out of whack with my health and trying to do too much um so that's been really helpful to like you know learn about my diet and how i can like eat certain things that are going to yeah. be body and I can do certain yoga poses that are going to help with like, you know, just being out of balance. Yeah. Um, so I think like the work for Quapi, the, the work that you brought up, it was just like, you know, just kind of in a really obvious way, like looking at um, this idea of chakras or energy centers or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them, but just this awareness that like, we're not separate from nature and yeah separate from these elements and, you know, they're a part of us and we're, yeah. and, um, you know, and I've been working really small, you know, just because of the COVID thing and being home and blah, 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 like working at a small scale was what I needed to do in that moment 
because I only had, you know, 30 minutes here or an hour here to like work. So I had to, you know, scale it. And then when my kids started going to school again, I was like, okay, I want to make big, I want to make big work. You know, I just uh-huh. have anything big for a while. Yeah. Um, and, that and these pieces big- are big y'all. I mean, they're are what, four feet by four feet on paper, right? Four feet uh, four feet. Yeah. yeah. It's also like, I want to try to make big art on paper because I've been yeah. working on paper and I love it. Excuse me. I love how, like you said, I can, um, I mean, I like to play with, um, fluidity, but structure and like, kind of like ride that line between Mm -hmm. um, those two things and, you know, order and chaos and, and and those are just, you know, think really important ideas within like Tantra and within, you know, yoga, this idea, like, um, yeah, the idea of just balance. finding that balancing point, you yeah. know, it's like this, di- a lot of times in certain spiritual circles or certain spiritual traditions, there's this aspect of like purity and denial, right? Like denying certain things for the sake of like, I think of Tantra as like the ultimate like balancing practice. And when a lot of people hear Tantra, they immediately think of like tantric sex and all yeah. that, which is a part, a, a very small part of, of it that's definitely in there in some small way, but has really nothing to do with the philosophy. It's really about, it's almost like this notion of like being in the world, but not of the world, like embracing the worldliness without attachment you know, and that involves a dynamic form of balance. Like, you know, and I think of, and that's why I love like how your work balances because it's not balancing in one particular way because you have that organic quality in there with the structure. And when I think of balance itself, it's a dynamic act. Like sometimes like when you think of the balance, it feels like a static thing. Like you're either balanced or you're not, but balance is a constant of imbalance, out of balance, imbalance, out of balance. It's like a constant flipping of the switch you know, I think about like when you're standing, let's say in an asana, like you're in eagle pose or a tree, you know, your muscles, yeah, you're still and you're balancing on that leg, but all the little micro movements happening in your muscles, these little twitches and flicks and you know what I mean? Like all that stuff that's happening is so quick and dynamic. So like, even though it on the outside, the macro, it looks static and still on the inside, on the micro, it is firing and moving tons of energy, tons of movement, you know? Um, And so I think that's such an important thing to remember with balance is like that it's dynamic and that the balancing point is constantly changing. It's almost like a dance. Mm -hmm. I think of Shiva, the dance of Shiva, you know, it's like, it's, you know? Um, And so I think that, and within your artwork, I think you're kind of doing that, you know? Um, And I think it's so beautiful to, again, feel that energy of that dynamic balance between the organic and sort of the architectural or the geometric, the structural components, you know, that are happening. And um, it's just, it's apparent. And then when we think about like the chakras, like what you're talking about, you know, these energy centers, like those are the places where, the bouncing points meet, you mm-hmm. know, at different mm-hmm. points in your body. Um, mm-hmm. There, it's cool. I think it's cool how they're like aligned with certain parts of your in, uh, your endocrine system. You yeah. know, right. like uh, Elma, like each chakra has like a subs has a physical part in the body that it's aligned with, and I find that to be like a fascinating thing to think about as well. That these aren't just like woo woo, like energetic right. things that we can't touch, but there is sort of like a physical home base that you can apply toward each chakra, at least when we're talking about this sort of basic system of the seven chakras, like you see in, in uh, the yoga tradition. Um, right. But, you know, you see the same kind of thing in, um, in traditional Chinese medicine with acupuncture and Qigong and Tai Chi um, and Taoism, you know, or in Tibetan Buddhism, the way that they illustrate these things. And they're all a little different, but they're saying the same thing essentially, um, mm-hmm. which I find to be really a fascinating thing to like unravel, you know, especially as a Western person who doesn't, who never grew up with this stuff, finding myself diving deep into it has been so revelatory, you know, because it's, I feel like it teaches you about the the system of the body and the mind and the intertwining of these two in ways that we're never taught as kids. Like no one teaches you there's no like operating manual for your body mind, you know, I, it's, it's crazy. We've spent, like you said, you used to kind of started yoga when you were in college, like maybe in your early twenties, like you spent two decades of your life, not really understanding much about your body. 
right? And now you've begun the journey where you're really learning about the body mind. And it's like, man, I wish we could just learn this from little kids, you know? And it's, it has changed so much. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is taught in schools now. Yeah. And so much more mainstream. I mean, it's really amazing. You know, my, yeah. my kids know about yoga. Like It's you know, amazing. I know it's incredible. So does my son, you know, like my son, what we do, we do meditation. He sees me practice yoga and meditate all the time. He likes to mimic and do it. And as long as he was into it, I'm going to teach him the little things that I know. Um, but like, it's amazing. And so I look at like this time we live in, that's like so volatile and like, we're kind of circling back to like the politics and the political environment we're in. I mean, we just had a big election yesterday. We're recording this on uh, November 10th right now. So, you know, there's big election the other day. And like, that's definitely a big part of the paradigm we're in, but we're also in the midst of like a major mental health crisis coming out of a pandemic, like all these things. But at the same time, we're dealing with such a tumultuous environment. We have this renaissance I feel like happening in psychedelic therapy and spirituality where meditation and mindfulness are coming into the mainstream consciousness. People are practicing that in ways they never had before, in the, at least in a, the Western sort of world. And then also the psychedelic research for PTSD, depression, anxiety, addiction, like all these things are coming up simultaneously as we're dealing with the craziest shit show that we can remember, right? And so I feel like this renaissance is budding. And when I look at, and this is part of what drew me to start this podcast is like, I see a parallel in a lot of what the artists are doing. And if we ever look at history, the artists are always sort of like the front runners kind of reflecting what's coming. You know what I mean? Like it's generally, that's generally how we see things. The artists are usually the ones who are tapping in a little bit earlier before the mainstream starts to come in. And so I see all these artists working and thinking about, you know, psychedelic experiences and spirituality and chakras and metaphysics and mystical stuff, you know, witchcraft and, you know, animism and alchemy and like, you know, and it's, and I was like, for me, it's like, we got to bring these people all together and like talk about these things yeah. so that they become more normalized. And they also become more, um, I don't know, I guess like easier for people who would normally be resistant to the stuff to enter these spaces. Mm -hmm. And so I look at you as an artist, as someone who is, creating a space for someone to be curious and maybe enter into an area of inquiry that they might not have ever really considered before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find it to be a really powerful time that we're in, even though there can be a lot of negativity thrown around, I see a lot of amazing things percolating in the background. I mean, I think people are, are just so hungry for it. I mean, hungry for healing and for some kind of spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like it's easy to be cynical, but um, I, yeah, I mean, that was definitely coming up a lot. You know, it's become up a lot in the last two years for me, just like how important it is to heal you know that yeah. we all have trauma i mean even like me as a i have privilege and i i understand that um but we've all had you know trauma <laughs> yeah are you familiar with uh gabber mate do you ever know who he is he's like um a really amazing um therapist and writer or like kind of a real thought leader in psychiatry and psychology and he talks a ton about trauma and that one point that he makes is that every single human, no matter who you are, even if you're the most privileged human to ever grace the earth, has experienced trauma by virtue of just being born. Right. And you know, like the, human the, ult is to have trauma. Yeah. the, the yeah. ultimate trauma. And so I think uh, we're dealing with layers and layers of trauma, both individually and collectively. But you, you're speaking of healing. Like, would you agree that like you can't really heal unless you know that you're sick or you know that you're unwell. And sometimes I feel like it's easy in this sort of, especially like in the American mindset of like, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and push through. And you know what I mean? This like hyper masculinity to like, you know, push through, like to negate what's actually happening actually limits you from the ability to transcend it and to heal it, you know? Um, and I think that's definitely something we're, we're dealing with as well, as well. And I feel the same thing in my own 
practice as an artist is that it's a healing modality for me because it's allowing me to release and let go, but also to bring attention and awareness to the shadows of my own consciousness, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is really an important part of the healing process and probably the scariest part is yeah. going going inward when you go on a self sort of inquiry journey you have to be able to be honest and real with yourself about the shadow sides of of your own consciousness um right. like carl jung would talk about like bringing the light into the shadow um not negating it and i think even on some collective level that's what we're dealing with the shadow has revealed itself of yeah. the collective unconscious through people like you could look at Donald Trump as maybe like a reflection of the shadow of the collective unconscious. Maybe you could look at it that way, you know, maybe you could say, if you're not <laughs> saying how horrible he is that he could be a teacher, right? You know, like, and that's like, I know I, I that's, a, that's on a deep level, but it's, like, you know, but yes, like if he, if he's the manifestation of all of this, we all have that. We all have that shadow side, like you say, mm-hmm. and his is like just on another level. Well, yeah, he is. He uh, is embodying like embodying. The, he's embodying like the the greatest form of the of ignorance, especially in the way that you know, just treating people, or even just the lack of acknowledgement of the harm he causes with words, you know. Um, I can think about if I really dig deep, I I've done that before, you know, the harm that I've caused through the words that choices that I've used in certain contexts, you know? Um, But I just, it's an interesting mirror game that happens both again, here we are back to the micro macro, right. To the individual and the collective. And so we're in this really interesting space right now. Um, yeah. And I think art is a tool of healing and a tool of awakening, um, even if it's subtle little ripples in the pond that you create through your work, because, mm-hmm. but each one matters, right? Right. And I mean, and we're both teachers, you know, art mm-hmm. teachers. And yeah. You're still teaching yoga, but I mean, so that's, that is so important to me. Like, I want to be able to give other people the tools and like access to I mean, just to creating, you know, yeah. there's such a joy in being able to create something new. And I think that that just like being able to make art during the lockdown, I just, it's like, it like boosted my self-esteem. I was like, you know, like I, I like, I don't know what's going on and there's like, the world's crazy, but like I'm, I'm working <laughs> on this painting. Like I could go down and like yeah. look at that I was making and I'm just mm-hmm. like, I feel good. Yeah, it's it's empowering. You know, it's very empowering. I feel like with my own students, you know, being able like that's I feel like the only goal that I have, I had to name one is to empower them with the notion that they are creators, that they are a part of their reality, that they even even through art making, but just even in the choices we make, we're creating the conditions in which we live in a lot of ways, because our mindset determines a lot about what is happening in terms of how we internalize or how we interpret what's happening. But just the empowerment to be like, I can make something like I can take something that didn't exist before ever and right. manifest it. And I think that to me, even if, you know, most of our students don't become artists, right. It's just right. a reality, right. but that experience I think is long lasting, even if they didn't, can't even recognize it, the experience of seeing that power they have inside of themselves to manifest something within and bring it into the tangible world exactly like that you can manifest this inner vision Mm -hmm. you know like i mean i think that's pretty amazing and i mean whether you manifest it in a realistic way or in an abstract way like that your art is this like manifestation of something that's internal like yeah in your mind it's in your heart like wherever it comes from but um i mean that's just pretty amazing to me you know, yeah. again, it's like kind of making that unseen thing, something that's like inside of us, mm-hmm. or maybe we're connecting to like a collective energy, whatever, Yeah. but that, that it can come through and then, you know, be manifested in a painting or some yeah. art. Um, I mean, I just think that's, that's really incredible. It's just kind of this like 
it's a gift, right? I think it's a gift that we have. I think it's almost in a way like what separates us. You know, we live in this time with like AI is like on the rise and AI is even right. making art right now, which is crazy. But I right. feel like AI was still had to be programmed in certain ways by a human. And I think that's yeah. still the greatest commodity that the humans have is the creative mind. Like, I don't think you could ever replicate the creative mind of a human. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the, you know, the technocrats and the futurists are like, no, you're an idiot. The computers can do everything that the human mind can do. I have my doubts based on my own personal experience of, you know, deep states of meditative, you know, awareness, or even like big psychedelic experiences where like, yeah, it, it there's something else, you know, that it, to, to like the consciousness of a real animate living being that can never really be replicated no matter how close we can get. Um, right. Right. And so it's like that to me is like, that is, that is the best thing that we can offer anybody, especially as teachers, right? If we're speaking that lens is like that you have this power inside of you to create things that never existed before to build the world that you want to see. And so to empower people with that, notion i think is that's what changes the world in my mind mm -hmm. is when people take ownership over their own creative capacities yes. um because yes. creativity as you know it can manifest it doesn't have to manifest in painting or drawing or sculpture like what we do it right. manifests in the way that you move through space and through the world or the way you move on your yoga mat right like there's creativity there right. um and so right. i think initiating people into that is is so crucial you know, and I think we're kind of naturally initiated to it as children. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, it becomes this thing that only certain people do and certain people don't do. Like we somehow somewhere, I don't know where that point happens. Have you noticed that in your own children? I, I assume not because you're an artist and you're, you know, so vibrant and creative all the time that they just feed off that. But have you noticed any of that, like where there's a point in their growth where like they start to identify or not identify as being a creative person? I mean, I think you're, I, I think you're right in that. I think people have such a narrow, not people, some people have a narrow idea of what create being creative means. Like they just mm -hmm. think like, oh, you're like an artist and like mm -hmm. you're saying, like there's so many ways you can be creative. So I think it's just, first of all, like acknowledging just like to be human, we have, we are creative, like beings, like, because we're alive. Yeah. Um, I mean, we just need to broaden what it, the idea of, of what creativity means, um, but I will tell you, I mean, if you tell people you're an art teacher, like, I feel like a lot of people have stories about like the bad art teacher they had that made them feel bad mm -hmm. about what they were making. And then they never wanted to make art again after that. And I'm just always like, Oh God, I you know, know. I, it I kills know. me. I hate it. You know, I know. And it's just like, just because you, you're not good at drawing realistically doesn't mean you're not a good artist. Like exactly. that's the way to do it. You know, it's just like, kind of, I wish we could. Well, it's our job, I think, to really broaden people's awareness of, of first of all, what creativity means, like, like you're saying. And second of all, like that you can be a, a, a visual artist in so many ways. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. Just because you can draw something realistically. That's, that's not the pinnacle of like, you know, um, I mean, once you can do that, then you want to do something else. Like you want to keep pushing it. Right. Yeah, definitely. So that's just a part, of course, like for me as a teacher, like I want to teach my students how to draw realistically, but then like move beyond that. Like exactly. Skill, and then it's like, okay, now, you know, okay, now you can draw. Great. Yeah. Like if you can draw, you can do anything. And it's so empowering to be able to have a thought and be able to draw it, you know, mm -hmm. like put it on paper. Um, but like, that's just the beginning. Exactly. You know, it's just a foundation. It's an experience cool. you need to have yeah. an awareness you need to have. It's like, I don't know who said it. Uh, you probably know the artist who says like, you know, you first learn the rules so that you can break them like an artist, you know, right. um, you know, right. it's like, cause that's, that's what our role is too. Like we're kind of tricksters as well, you know, yeah. like we're here to like kind of flip things on their head or to, to like, I don't know, like, it's, it's interesting the role that an artist has, like, especially in the culture that we live in now. And part of me feels like that role could be also like, I, I hate to use the word shaman, but like can have those qualities of like initiatory, like 
the artist can play the role of like nurturing these seeds of greater levels of consciousness, whether it's through the actual work or through the engagement that they have with their audience in some way. Um, but I mean, you, you definitely, there's an energetic exchange that happens in creativity and the creative act. And I think when you bring more consciousness to it, you kind of create something that has a resonance, um, in, I don't know, that can uh, impact people in ways they might not have ever expected. Right. And I find that to be a powerful thing too. Like when I think about my own work, like I, I want them to be like little blessings in the world. You know what I mean? Wherever they are, they're just like little mini little blessings, little like, you know, namaste is like little beams of light and love and rainbows and whatever. But I also want them to be in uh, both doing that out, but also at the same time, pulling you in, you know, yeah. like what we talked about you know, kind of doing both at the same time. It's like, it's an opportunity to shine, but also an opportunity to like go within and be like a meditative object. And I, definitely see that in your work as being kind of an object of meditation. Do you ever meditate on your act on your pieces? Like when you're finished with them, like yourself? I mean, I feel like just making the art. is like my meditation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Cause it's um, cause I, because I get so focused and it's, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm trying to attempt if I sit down and like, I'm going to meditate. Yeah. Um, but I I can get it I can get there so much quickly if I'm if I'm making art you yeah. know so I I guess it's just um, and then yeah like of course you're making and then you sit back and you look and you kind of like feel and I mean you know I'm sure you have the same feeling like when you're looking at something you're you're looking for balance you're mm-hmm. looking for you know balance in color and form and line and t- you know all these like formal elements of art yeah also looking for imbalance because if it's yeah. too balanced it's like it's, it's stagnant mm-hmm. you know you want to have that dynamic energy yeah but it's also got to be balanced but yeah. it's, it can't be static you know so mm-hmm. so I think about that and it's and that's where abstraction I think is just so amazing because mm-hmm. you're not working with like these like realistic forms you're just yeah. working with sh- pure shape and of course, that's so related to natural. I mean, geometry and sacred geometry is, comes from nature, right? Yes, exactly. It's woven into it. Yeah. So it's still like, yeah, it, it is abstract, but abstraction comes from nature and from reality. Yeah. Right? So it gives it like a universal quality to it. It, tra- yeah. it can transcend language and boundaries. And I think that's why like the early modernists, like someone like Kandinsky, you know, was so interested in abstraction because of its universality. Yes. Um, and I think modernism was a lot about that. And then postmodern is like all about like the hyper relativism, everything is relative to this. And then I feel like we're stuck in that postmodern in some ways culturally. And that's what's causing a lot of issues because it's both. There's both relative and absolute, you mm-hmm. know, universal and relative truth, like what, you know, what the Buddha talked about, you know, it's a big, big component to Buddhist philosophy is relative and absolute truth. And we have to be able to hold both together, just like with your work, you know, holding the micro and the macro together. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a beautiful like, thing, huh? Can you even see me anymore? <laughs> You're disappearing into the no, dark, and I darkness. love it. I don't have any lights on in the room. It's okay. But this was really, this was really a great light. conversation. I mean, we're we're coming up on an hour here, but um, yeah. I just, you know, I feel like we could just keep going and going and totally. going. And I really right. just yeah. appreciate you and and what you're putting out in the world. And um, I just, you know, I see you're making work all the time on your Instagram. I mean, all those, that the series of the little pieces that you're doing is just amazing to see alongside the experiments you're doing with dying. The, is it dying canvas? Um, well, or, I, yeah, the dying canvas and then also dying paper. In dying paper, but then you're also sewing into it now. So like, Selling I just, out, yeah. I just love how experimental you're being. And so um, for those of you out there, definitely you got to check out Skylar's work and really see what she's up to. She's always experimenting and playing with what all the materials that she has. And I'm just, I just appreciate you so much. So oh, thank, thank you so you. much for uh, I, being on I the mean, podcast. Help you, me kick this like, thing off. <laughs> oh, of course. Of course. This awesome. Is awesome, Martin. I've, 
you um, get where I'm coming from in so many ways. It's just like, I love it. You know, it's not, um, we're on a, a similar wavelength. For Definitely. Sure. We're, we're, you know, the parallel paths, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's just a pleasure to be able to talk to to someone that just gets it. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much again, Skylar. Thank you. All right, take care. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Concerning the Spiritual and Art. If you like what we're doing here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can stay in touch and in tune with all the amazing offerings that we're going to be uh, bringing to this channel. Um, thanks again for all your support. Super grateful and uh, yeah, excited to uh, bring more content your way. Peace, y'all.